Okay, this is the audio for Chapter 2, Code of the Street, Campaigning for Respect. Okay, so social capital is basically having a group that brings you social rewards in society. So this is often knowing the right people or knowing the right way to do things that can give you access and opportunity, right? So typically an example of this would be, you know, depending on if you are a first generation college student or not. So let's say you are the first in your family to go to college, then you're lacking social capital, right? Because social capital is the kind of knowledge and experiences of those around you that can help you, knowing the right people that can help you navigate systems, right? College is complicated. Like let's say you wanna change your major or you wanna just anything admissions and records-y. It's helpful when you have someone who's already gone through that to help you know how to do those things, right? So if you have, you know, your parents went to college, you have older siblings who went to college, things like that, you have social capital because they can help you navigate that system, right? So in the context of Code of the Street, respect becomes social capital, meaning that it's protective. It's a mindset that people need to protect themselves because they can't rely on authorities oftentimes, right? And so this kind of creates this evidence of a racial double standard in the criminal justice system that certain communities have much quicker response times than others. And so this is you know, very critical for staying out of harm's way <clears throat> because it gives you the knowledge of how to get past barriers, how to keep yourself safe, and how to be able to navigate complicated, violent situations, but protect yourself. Okay, so it's important to understand some of the context of this stuff. So as far as socialization, obviously our parents are our primary agents of socialization. And as we age, the importance of peers increase to us. So peers become more important than what our parents think. And kids tend to shun their parents for their peers once you hit about junior high. So it's interesting he talks about how the street serves as a mediating influence. And so this means that that makes kids question what their parents socialize them with, right? If your parents say, hey, work hard, you know, then you'll get opportunities. But then you see the people that have the most aren't the ones who are working the hardest, right? They're often people that are engaged in the underground economy or maybe the drug trade, right? So the street itself serves as a mediating influence because it affects the way that kids get to see, you know, who is actually a success, who has, you know, material support, social support, you know what I mean? Like who's the most popular, who has the most status? It's not the guy who works three jobs, right? And so that kind of affects the way that kids start to question what their parents taught them. And so the street itself can overwhelm decent socialization. That just means that the, every kid is confronted with a local hierarchy based on toughness. And you know, where being a good fighter can be what gives you status, right? So a kid can go either way, whether they were socialized decent or street, you know, the kind of home influence they have obviously does affect their value system, but it doesn't determine their fate. Right, so the social and economic opportunities of the neighborhood and the environment really affect what kind of path a kid takes. Meaning, if it becomes almost a logical decision to be in a gang for your self-protection, then that kind of mitigates any sort of influence of parents saying that they shouldn't do that, right? So that's what they mean by the street overwhelming decent socialization. And so in another way too, they internalize connections between being respected and the need for physical control. So by age 10, a lot of kids are hanging out socially on the street. And adolescents everywhere are pretty insecure, just as a standard. <laughs> and they're trying to establish their identities. So they can see violence and learn that hierarchy and see, hey, I can move up the hierarchy if I'm able to be good at violence, right? So the youth learn that the social order of their peer group is open to change. And that's why they're so interested in it, because they can go up in rank or maintain a high rank, right, from how well they operate with violence. And so younger children really learn the code of the street because they watch the fights between older kids. They learn the consequences for failure. And really adults reinforce this code all the time by saying things like, watch yourself, don't be a punk, respect yourself, right? So appearing capable of taking care of yourself is almost a form of self-defense. This is a dominant theme among both the street-oriented and the decent adults who are you know, really concerned with the safety of their children because of these problems. So basically another kind of terminology that they talk about is having a self image based on juice. So juice being that share of respect that you have in the community. So there's this idea that you need to fight to increase it 
or risk being tried or rolled on. So really, it's important not to lose that respect, um, even with your friends, because they might not back you up in a fight if you lose that respect. So the respect becomes almost like a shield, but you know it's easy to lose. So what does protect a person? Well, first is the number of people who are willing to avenge them and the status of their friends. So in this way, if you're street oriented, this manages your self image. It's sh basically shaped by what you think others think of you. So in relation to your peers, it's kind of this classic, what we call social interaction theory in sociology, Irving Goffman, what he calls the presentation of self, right? That we basically navigate situations in our minds basically as the object of ourselves, like we see ourselves in our minds and we think of how other people look at us. So we see ourselves as we think they see us, right? And then that affects the way we act. So we act according to how we think they will react, right? So kind of like looking in a mirror to see the reflection, right? So we look into other people to see how they reflect back either their approval or disapproval of us, right? And so it's interesting, Goffman basically, you know, an extreme version of Goffman's presentation of self would be like Instagram, right? Where people present a certain image of themselves because they want it to be a positive image. Like most people don't tag themselves in like terrible photos or, you know, if your friend tags you in one, you like take it down because you're like, no, right? Why? Because you want to maintain a positive presentation of self where you get to kind of manipulate the way other people see you. Of course, Goffin was talking about it in a face-to-face -face situation, but obviously social media has opened that up to a whole other realm. So what's interesting too is in this kind of atmosphere of respect, there's an importance of objects because they help gain, not just gain status, but keep status because they have to be defended. So basically, if you're in a crowd of people and you're wearing like the nicest clothes, you're wearing like, you know, pretty nice jewelry, things of that stuff, that it's kind of expected. Otherwise, you appear socially deficient. So what happens, though, is that you're saying, like, like let's say, a gold chain in the context of this, co of this coat of the street, right? If you're wearing something that is pretty expensive, then you're basically saying, I'm not afraid of you trying to come up and steal this from me because I can defend myself, right? So there's kind of like a message that comes along, like that symbolizes the meaning of clothing, right? So, but the context of this is that people can get killed over the, like these tiny things, like get killed over a hat. So the relationship with objects is very complicated as we'll talk about. So campaigning is basically just to take other people's stuff, to be able to violate someone, to raise yourself up by putting other people down. And this is always in flux as the ranks and the hierarchy change with each confrontation. And so constant vigilance is required so this becomes heightened in adolescence and they often are willing to risk their lives to maintain it because again, if you feel like nihilistic and there's no hope for the future, then right now is all we have, right? And so what's interesting about this too, I think the best example of this, which I'm sure all of you have seen, you probably haven't seen the movie Juice starring, uh, but anyway, um, starring Tupac, but you may have seen the movie Friday, which I'm assuming you have. And there's this kind of, <laughs> if you haven't, I'll just give it to you in broad strokes. Basically, there's a particular character in the movie Friday. And again, not a perfect characterization, but somewhat a good illustration that you might have seen. Um, where he basically goes around the neighborhood campaigning, like just ripping people off, taking their stuff. So there's a scene where, you know, the, basically the main characters hide their jewelry, hide anything valuable because he's rolling by. And then after he leaves they defiantly put the stuff back on and like, yeah, 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 I wasn't afraid of him anyway, right? And it's just kind of this, this way of, of taking, you know, how important this works in this kind of aspect of respect and turning it around, right? All right, so another part of this, or another aspect of this whole campaigning situation is staging areas, meaning where you actually campaign, <laughs> right? So a person's reputation is also linked to the reputation of their neighborhood. Right? And the reputation of the neighborhood affects the reputation of the high school that they attend, often because, again, we talked about before, the structural inequalities in education, the poorer the neighborhood, the poorer the school. So oftentimes the violence and the issues going on outside of the school are also going on inside of the school. So staging areas are just hangouts where a wide mix of people gather. And so this is where the campaigns are waged, right? Like oftentimes street corners, liquor stores, strip malls, sometimes larger events like movie theaters, concerts, sports events. So basically people from other neighborhoods are also there representing their own neighborhoods. And so 
this is where the material possessions become an important part of representing, right? Being able to kind of show, I'm not afraid that you're gonna victimize me because I'm able to defend myself, right? So then some more of the terminology they talked about too was a statement and a beef. So a statement is a challenge or something is interpreted as a challenge, such as cutting in line, right? That the challenge itself, um, basically if you challenge that statement, it becomes a beef. So let's say someone tries to cut in front of you in line and the example I gave to you before was, if that person looked like Bill Gates, you'd be like, hey, what the hell? It would become a beef, right? You'd be like, what the hell do you think you're doing? But if it was Dwayne The Rock Johnson, you'd be like, go ahead, sir. Go ahead and cut in line, no problem, right? So anyway, the statement is when someone does something that could be interpreted as a, as a slight or as a challenge to someone's like autonomy and respect. But a beef is when you actually like challenge them and go forward on the fight, right? And what's interesting about this is sometimes these things escalate a lot later. And the reason that the code basically causes a lot of these conflicts because the code of the street says you never back down. Even no matter how petty, you never back down. So sometimes fights happen actually at a later place because you know, there's some sort of beef, but then people kind of scatter, go retrieve weapons, and then there's an alternate location where the fight actually happens. So it's really interesting, this kind of idea of why people fight. And there's this great book called Violence, a Microsociological Approach, which I always suggest, but people never read because it's like crazy huge. But anyway, it's a great book. But he talks about how as social creatures, we kind of organize around interaction and cooperation. So as, a fa as that fact, most of us have a hard time actually enacting violence, right? Largely because it creates a sort of tension and fear in us. So if you think about most of the fights you've ever seen, they end in bluster, meaning like, what, 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 hold me back, hold me back, bro. Oh, you're, you're looking my friends are here, bro. That kind of whole thing, right? I don't know why it's always bros, but it is, right? So, <laughs> you know, this kind of idea that you're like, what, what? You're like sizing someone up, you're blustering largely because it's an energy exchange. The idea is that if I go, what, and you like flinch, then any tension or fear I have has been overwhelmed by your flinching. Does that make sense? So basically, you know, the kind of energy exchange of like, I can overcome my tension and fear and, you know, throw a punch because I feel that, you know, I'm going to win. So it's interesting, in that book he talks about how we really characterize in American society fights as fair fights, but they're almost never fair fights. It's always someone who thinks that they can win. <laughs> and what's interesting about that is, I know there's those people that have a screw loose and will fight like 10 people, but that's largely what he calls the violent elite. And oftentimes that does connect back to what we see in Code of the Street, where some people, because of the experiences they've had from early childhood of having to be violent, you know, oftentimes by the age of seven or eight, means that they've normalized violence to such an extent that it always seems like basically the tool in the toolkit to use to solve all problems, right? So what's also interesting is that when you talk about bystander effect, this is basically the, a situation where people are not likely to jump into a fight. I mean, obviously in these situations, someone could have a weapon and the altercation could be fatal, but also a lot of times people don't get involved because of this term called bystander effect, this idea that Sometimes people feel as if um, someone else will do it. It's basically this idea of kind of your social responsibilities being diffused, right? So let's say there's 10 people present. And actually the one that, that's important with this is like, let's say you think you're having a heart attack or something like that. What you need to do is like point at someone and be like, you in the white sweater with the glasses, call the police. Because if you don't, if you just kind of expect someone to help you, oftentimes people look to each other to kind of do what we call in social psychology, the definition of the situation. Like, is there emergency? Is everything okay? So people look to other people to see how to react. And so I'm gonna show you this video, which I love and has some interesting social psychology um, tests from the, well, basically research that they did in the 70s. Um, that's kind of a little bit hilarious, some of it, but it really does kind of connect back to this issue of why is it that we don't all jump into action when these things happen? Well, largely, oftentimes, we feel someone else will do it, right? And so the whole reason that they, they started studying this concept of the bystander effect was because of this horrific murder of this young woman in New York where she got murdered on the street in front of many of her neighbors and no one called the police. And the idea is when they started researching this, they started to think, well, maybe it's because they all thought someone else already did call the police. So that's why they didn't call. Right? So it's not that just their, her neighbors were all monsters, <laughs> it's just more so that you know, they kind of feel the responsibility you feel if you're the only per person there 
kind of gets spread out among a lot of people. So I'm going to try to add that clip in here and hopefully it'll let me without violating any sort of YouTube stuff. In 1964, 38 New Yorkers watched through their windows as one of their neighbors was brutally murdered. Her name was Kitty Genovese, a 28-year-old woman. The Genovese incident where a young woman coming home late at night from her work was assaulted by somebody who was one of those random crazy people. Kitty was running up the block and Winston Mosley ran after her until she reached the midpoint of the block almost directly under this street light. Mosley caught up with her and stabbed her four times in the back. Her screams were loud, unmistakable, and reverberated throughout the entire area. Lights went on in, in the windows around the courtyard, so we know that people were seeing this. Nobody called the police. Somebody who lived on the seventh floor opened his window and yelled out, what's going on down there? When Mosley heard somebody yelling out, he ran back to his car. Kitty was still alive. She managed to get up. She staggers around the corner here, still screaming. People in that building heard her as well. And she collapses inside this hallway. There's one apartment above there. It was occupied by Carl Ross. Carl opened his door at the time that Mosley returns and he saw the second attack taking place. And he did nothing. After stabbing Kitty another eight times in this very hallway, the killer ran away, leaving Kitty to bleed to death. Eventually, a neighbor called the police, but it was too late. Kitty died before the ambulance could get her to the hospital. That shocked the city. Now, it's not that a person got murdered to shock the city. That happens, sadly. It's that a person got murdered and her neighbors watched and nobody did anything. Bib Latme and I, we read about the murder as did everybody else. Here we were two young social psychologists starting our research careers. We knew about Stanley Milgram's set of experiments on obedience to authority. And we started to think about, in an offhand way, what could have produced the Genovese effect. Perhaps Kitty Genovese might have been alive today if fewer people had seen her. There were perhaps 38 people who could have responded, but each were looking to see what these other people were doing. decided to try to create a relatively ambiguous situation in which we could see how people responded. We thought that one kind of thing that comes up that's often hard to tell whether it's a real emergency or not uh, has to do with fire. You see smoke coming through the vent. And it is ambiguous. What do you do? Hey, um, there's, there's smoke coming out from under the door in that room where I was filling out the questionnaire. Almost everybody does that if they face the smoke alone. Now let's have you face the smoke with two strangers. One person can be seen glancing at the other. The other is continuing to fill out the questionnaire. It's getting a little more smoky in the room, but nonetheless, you stay in the room. By and large, people surrounded by people who react as if there's nothing wrong, don't respond. Everybody sees the other people not reacting, so they create a definition of the situation. No emergency. To test their theories about how groups and individuals respond differently to a crisis, Darley and Latine conducted a second experiment. This time, the emergency was clearly defined. 
would like to thank the two of you for being here today to help out in the study. In this experiment, one student was asked to communicate via intercom with another student down the hall. If somebody give me a little help here because I, I have a problem. I've got one, one of these, these things coming on. What sounded like a real seizure in the subject's headphones was just a tape recording of an actor playing a role for the experiment. If somebody would, would give me a, a little, little help. Or, or, Hello? Could somebody or, help? Or, if you knew there was nobody else but you to help, you got up, you opened the door of your room, and you headed off to find the person. On the other hand, if there were three or four other people present who you heard... I would like to thank the three of you for being here today to help us with the study. We are interested in... Learning. You are much less likely to respond yourself. Somebody give me a little, a little help here. The responsibility any individual feels for helping is diffused when there are other people who could also help. So what can we say back to the bystanders in the Genovese situation? The first thing we can say, I think, is they got a bum rap. They were reacting the way that you or me might react in those situations. There have been many incidents like the Jenny VC incident since then. And there have been many incidents in which people who could help don't help. Okay, so Tyree's story. Remember, he uses these people to kind of give you examples of some of the concepts he's talking about in the book. So Tyree's experience is interesting. He's 15 years old. His house burns down. So he moves in with his grandma. And in the neighborhood he lived in before, he was kind of like this head guy in his like local, you know, small youth street gang. And so, um, you know, he kind of was like a tiny little shot caller. And so basically he moves though, right? His house burns down, so he has to move. He moves in with his grandma. And now he has to meet the new street kids to try to get in good with them. So he goes to the store to get some stuff for his grandma. And he gets rolled on by these 20, like, young boys like him, you know, young adults, I guess, whatever you want to call them. And so there's nothing you can do, right? There's 20 kids. That's all you can do. So um, they just kind of beat the crap out of him, leave him on the street. And so later he sees one of the boys that was in that group of, like, 20, and he punches him in the face. And he does this in an effort to get some of that lost respect back. And of course he knows that that's dumb, so he then he avoids them and he lays low and he's literally like taking back streets around the neighborhood just trying to like keep out of, you know, contact with these other kids. But basically this idea that even though he had risen the ranks in the hierarchy in his old neighborhood, he moves and he has to start all over again, right? And what's interesting too, he also talks about how the code is not new, right? This is something that this idea of connecting, you know, violence with respect, <laughs> that's not new. I mean, you can look at Rome or the Shogun Warriors, the, the American Old South, right? Working class Scotch or Irish communities, right? Um, you know, some Latinx communities, uh, Italians, right? People like that. This idea of, you know, respect and violence is, is pretty, pretty connected in a lot of cultural ide ideations. But the difference is, is within this context is the profound economic dislocation meaning that you don't have legitimate jobs. So this means people are driven to the underground economy, right? And the underground economy itself, the drug markets, the illegal gun markets, etc., cetera, um, other kind of crime things, re also rely on the code of the street, these expectations of, if you don't do what I say, there's violence as a consequence. So this exacerbates all the conditions that are already happening because of those economic dislocations. So it's not like they created this brand new belief system. It's something that runs throughout a lot of cultural value systems, but it's because people are so desperate that it causes this to actually be even more, uh, you know, aggrandized. So anyway, um, basically getting back to Tyree, he sees that group again, right? He's laid low for a couple weeks, but he's trying to get on the bus and he's like, damn it, he sees that group coming and you can't run. Now, why can't you run? Well, because of the code of the street. The code of the street says that it's better to stay and fight and get the crap beat out of you than to run, 
right? Because running is weakness. So anyway, he basically, he can't run. So he just walks up to them and he's like, hey, I want to hang out with you. And so they're like, all right, okay, you can hang out with us, but you have to fight JC. And JC is a much larger boy than him. I think what, he was 15 and, and JC was like, what, 18, 19, somewhere in there, like much bigger, physically bigger. Um, so they actually spar for quite a long time and it's a pretty intense fight. Of course Tyree loses because he's supposed to lose. They like stack the fight against him, right? But he put up a good fight and he showed a lot of courage which actually ends up winning him the respect of the group. And then that's what gets him into that social group, right? So he kind of uses Tyree's experience as one example of how this actually works in you know one person's life to kind of show the more broad strokes he's making about what's going on in the neighborhood. So Malik is a friend of Tyree's who's about the same physical size. And it's interesting, like him and Tyree kind of appoint themselves as defenders of the neighborhood. So, you know, basically kind of questioning anyone else from any other gangs that are coming into the space. So for this defense, they claim the area is their domain, right? So anything that happens in the neighborhood becomes their business. So Malik and Tyree hang out a lot, right? And they're really willing to back each other up because they have that kind of close relationship. So they get into a fight after talking to some girls, right? I'm sure that's never happened in the history of men, right? And so they decide to fight physically to solve their conflict. But what's interesting is the physical fight is different than some of the other fights you see in, this, in the context of the neighborhood. Meaning the fight has rules. Meaning, um, so for example, they also apologize when they get close to breaking those rules. So for example, no slapping in the face, you know, nothing below the belt, right? Things like that. And if they get a little close to that, they're like, oh, sorry, and they'll reset. But it's interesting how violence is still used as a way to mitigate the conflict of like who gets to date that girl, but the violence isn't as aggressive and it isn't as um, trying to cause harm in the same way, right? It's more of like bonding violence. So it's interesting, basically he uses this kind of example to highlight these fictive kinship relationships. So fictive kin are just forms of social ties that are not based on blood relation or marital relation. And pretty much everybody, you don't have to live in a poor neighborhood to have fictive kin, right? Like I have an uncle, Uncle Pat, who I was probably like eight, seven or eight years old before I realized that wasn't actually my uncle. <laughs> because I mean, he even kind of like looked like my uncles, but he was best friends with my dad and my dad's brother that are about, you know, a year and a half apart. So they just always, you know, were always together, always hanging out and, you know, I just learned to call him uncle from a young age. So even though I know biologically he's not my uncle, he still might as well be because he's that close in the family. Do you know what I mean? So I'm sure everyone has that kind of, or maybe you know someone that does, has that kind of situation where you have people that, you know, they might not be your blood, but they feel like they're your blood because they're still basically your family, right? So this is very important in situations where a lot of these kids don't have, you know, real good kind of family formations or just don't have, um, you know, kind of positive relationships even with their blood family. So it can be really helpful to have some sort of social tie, right? Okay, so the concept of gender is always, it's always right there, right? So this concept of manhood or being distinguished as a man implies a physicality and a certain kind of ruthlessness. So it's fascinating they talk about the connection of manhood and self-esteem or the kind of chicken and the egg. So manhood and respect are seen as two sides of the same coin. If you're not a real man, then you're diminished as a person. And so this is used as a way to kind of push people down a social hierarchy and, you know, denigrate them. And so again, this isn't like completely alien to everywhere else in the world. I put this clip in here, which again, I'm going to try to put in this video, but it may not let me if it's copyrighted. So otherwise, just click on it from the PowerPoint and you'll be able to watch it. But it's just a trailer for a film called The Mask You Live In. And the idea that these concepts of manhood are not an island to this neighborhood, right? It's really part of a larger message about masculinity that's in our whole society, right? That men and women receive regardless of your age, your class, your race, your gender, any of that. We all receive these messages of how men should be and what the expectations are for their behavior. So I'm going to put that link in here and hopefully it works. If not, you can just click on it from your PowerPoint and you'll be able to watch it. So you get what I'm talking about, about how these things are so pervasive in our culture and what some of the consequences are to those limiting representations of masculinity.
Stop crying. Yeah. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotions. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mind. Nobody shit. likes a tattletale. Bros come before hoes. Don't let you women run your you life. You bitch. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. We've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity. So we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing. And what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. In good times, guys are like really close to each other. But when things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. Once I kind of went into high school, I struggle finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our students don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women, go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder, or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I just had suicide thoughts in my head at sixth grade. I felt alone for, for a long time, and I actually thought about killing myself. Whether it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence, people resort to such desperate behavior only when they are feeling shamed and humiliated or feel they would be if they didn't prove that they were real men. If you're told from day one, don't let nobody disrespect you, and this is the way you handle it as a man, respect is linked to violence. If I can man up, why step down from there, you feel me? It's like instinct. So man up! Man up! Man up! Man up! Man up. Some fucking balls! Act like a man! Be a man! Be a man! For my kids, I was going to end this hyper-masculine narrative here. Okay, when it comes to nerve and manhood, so demonstrating nerve is important, meaning being willing to throw the first punch, right? Or being willing to pull the trigger, right? True nerve is basically not showing a fear of death. And so that's problematic as hell when you're talking about young people that don't even have full brain development of 25 years old, right? So willingness to take a life is also considered powerful. So both decent and street, no matter, you know, their orientation or what their families are, they try to create this impression, right? That they have nerve, that they're willing to go as far as they have to go, basically. And so the decent can code switch in these situations, like they can wear the clothing, they can say the things, but then when the cops show up, they can be like, yes or no, sir, yes, sir, <laughs> and, you know, kind of get out of those situations. But the street-oriented just don't. Um, so school is in a very important staging area because we're talking about mostly young adults here. So another issue, again, we talked about before was just the problems of the school itself, that these schools are racially segregated and situated in impoverished inner city communities where violence, drugs, and crime are rampant. And so what's interesting is in early schooling, most kids accept the legitimacy of the school and they go there to learn and they enjoy it. But by about fourth grade, the ideology of the code of the street affects schooling. So the youth embrace the street code and then school just becomes a primary staging area for campaigning for respect. So there's social isolation and alienation we discussed before, and it's really due to the persistent poverty and the neighborhood dynamics. Also, some of the family backgrounds of these kids and the lack of available role models. So for many of these young kids, they're alienated, right? Going to school and doing well 
becomes associated with being middle class or being white. So the code states that it's more important to show you can defend yourself physically than, you know, get an A on an exam. So it kind of affects the kind of uh, trajectories or really the impacts of what kids want to focus on, you know, being cool, not being smart. And again, even being smart is more so in this context, being street smart than being book smart, right? So again, in a highly competitive setting, a lot of people are deprived. And the more deprived you are, the more you're, you're meant to feel bad. You're pushed to feel jealous of your peers. So again, this idea of a hierarchy where you set out to put other people down by lifting yourself up, by either teasing people verbally or using physical altercations, that this often, you know, some of these street kids are dealing with mental illness. They were abused by their parents. They're facing trauma or, you know, the experiences of violence. And as a result, they're acting out. And oftentimes with kids, instead of, you know, stopping to kind of say, why are they acting this way and how can we help them? We just see them as bad kids, especially once they reach adolescence, right? But um, there's this actually great series that was on Viceland for a while called um, Last Chance High School that talks about this. Actually, I had a student that was working at a similar institution in California. Basically, kids are sent there right before they get sent to juvie and have pretty much no hope after that. And one of the examples in that Viceland thing, they did an interview with one of the kids that he had been kicked out of his normal school for breaking his teacher's wrist, which is obviously very extreme because the teacher put her hand in his face and he broke her wrist. Obviously very extreme. But then when they start interviewing him, they talk about how he watched his brother get murdered in front of him, how his youngest sister was killed by gun violence in the neighborhood, and all of these other tragic, violent things that have happened to him. But he's still processing his trauma. And so this is why it's very important to kind of understand the context of where these kids are coming from to see like, no, they need help and intervention. They don't just need to be criminalized. All right. So <laughs> obviously using the school as a staging area undermines the whole mission of the school. Right, meaning what's out on the street gets brought into the classroom. And this is problematic because the whole point of the school is to help provide resources and opportunities to get out of these situations, right? Though they're not doing that because oftentimes they lack the funding and the structure. But there's also the fact that a lot of the youth in the neighborhood aren't seeing successful people, especially in the context of being racial minorities, aren't seeing successful black people who have gone through school and gone on to do well. Meaning, if, you're, if your neighbors, if the people in your community that are doing the best have like a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD, then you're thinking, maybe I need to do that too so I can have that success, right? But when most of the people you know that have success or have money did not do that, it doesn't give you an incentive to go to school, right? So if the decent want to do well in school, it can also undermine their street credibility, right? So remember, that doesn't kind of matter in some contexts, right? You still want to do well in school, but remember, the street credibility is what keeps them safe and what provides them with self-esteem. So the code is kind of oppositional to schooling and larger mainstream values. So school becomes not a place to learn. It becomes a place to represent yourself, meaning that youth take great care with their appearance and they're encouraged to campaign for respect by adopting a street attitude. So this is in their look or presentation of self overall. So this is why the decent struggle to maintain their credibility. And he even talked about in the book how some kids would change their clothes on the way to school because their parents wouldn't let them dress in a certain way, but they wanted to dress that way in order so that their peers gave them more respect, right? And so this also becomes a problem with authority figures, right? Because they're seen as alien and unresponsive. So some challenge their teachers whose role is to manage unruly kids without being di disrespected. So this kind of like the teacher becomes connected with the institution. And if you reject the institution, then you reject the teacher. So it basically becomes a very adversarial us versus them relationship, which obviously is not, is not positive, right? But kind of in the same way that it does with police and other authority figures. So the school becomes a microcosm for the community, meaning that all of the ills that are happening outside of it are happening within it. But you can still expect some amount of order at school right? It's just not what it should be, in, especially in middle-class schools. So what happens to these decent kids? So five and eight-year-old kids, street kids, are basically already out on the street, playing in the street, making friends that become their large street families or their fictive kin later on when they're older. So they develop a separate identity from their parents in the streets at a pretty young age. And what's interesting is in the neighborhood, groups of youth dominate the public spaces, like the group who rolled up on Tyree, right? Most of them come from bad situations and they become street families 
due to a lack of family and social support. So the decent are often pressed to show others what they're made of. And so young people who project decency are not given respect in the streets because a nice attitude is taken as a sign of weakness. And the street code says it's better to be feared than to be loved, right? So again, coming back to this majority mindset thing, I just find this fascinating that when a majority of kids are decent-minded, the norms of the group will be decent-minded and the majority will display decency in the presence of adults. But in these areas where violence is another component in presentation, in this impoverished neighborhood, there's not a majority of decent values being displayed. So the youth are encouraged by the dominant youth to play the rules of the street, which is interesting that the dominant group becomes the ones that are only about 20, 30% of the neighborhood. And so it's fascinating that this goes against majority mindset, which in most cases kind of sets the tone for what's expected in a space. But because of the, you know, adding violence into the mix, that affects what people are willing to do and how they do it.